folks all right we are going to be going over uh this is going to be 1.1 today we're going to cover the foundations of psychology as well as some of the early perspectives in psychology and then you'll have another short screencast um going over more of the contemporary forms so this one will be a bit longer um and then we'll get into some of the other stuff so we're going to start with the foundations of psychology this is the way way back okay so stuff you need to know on these foundations of psych okay um so if we're looking at psychology and like what is it which is still i think a question that's probably on a lot of your minds um psychology if we're looking at the etymology which is the uh, what the word means where it gets its foundation and it starts with this idea of a soul the study of the soul um, is the etymology of psychology and i think that that says a lot because psychology isn't just what's happening in the brain um, it's, you're going to learn that it's a lot more than that. It's what's happening in our bodies. It's what's happening, um, with our emotions. It's what's happening with our perspectives and how we see the world. And also like how we're processing and thinking about that both consciously and subconsciously. There's so much going on. We've got to be able to look at all of that. Um, and the way that the ancients looked at that was, was through the understanding of the only way they could describe things they couldn't understand was through the soul. So what psychology is, is a study of that, the soul, which is kind of the all-encompassing um, description of what we, what we are. Um, so early psychology thought, like the first that we could really start to give people credit for psycholo psychological thought, um, are we looking at like the, the early philosophers, um, the Greek thinkers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Um, there's a good chance you're probably not going to have to know these. I'm going to go over them just in case. I'm going to do it pretty quickly, but I strongly still would, would say um, you should probably recognize the differences between these. Again, um, my recommendation, what you're doing now is you've got notes out and you're jotting down some thoughts as if this were a real lecture, right? When we take quizzes, you'll have a chance to, they will be timed. When we take tests, they'll be timed. Um, I will allow you to use your notes on those um, and the more that you have with you in those paper forms, the better they're going to be. Um, we are, if you are, I am going to expect you to use a Chromebook and like a lockdown browser. So um, the more that you can have notes and stuff, the better. So early psychological thoughts. Um, Socrates and Plato were the, the first, and they believed that um, oh, in this idea called dualism, right? Is that knowledge is this thing that we all have. It's all, it's born into all of us. It's just how much we are able to like, um, to, to access that knowledge in some way. We dig into what we already have and what other humans have accomplished. Uh, dualism believes that that is innate and that there is a separate mind and body. That's the big idea of dualism. Dual to mind and body. They are separate. Um, the mind is separate. The mind would be like the soul and it would continue after we die. However, Aristotle uh, gets a little bit closer to uh, the right idea is monism. Is like that knowledge it comes from experience and is stored in the mind, which not thinking about people, um, you know, 400 years uh, before are like modern timekeeping. So we're talking like 2,400 years ago already had this idea that we understand things based on how we, what we do. And then from there, we store it in our minds. Like, what? I don't, how did you possibly come up with that? But dualism, monism, that's the big idea. You're probably not going to have to know who did them but I'd write them down anyways. Basically, no, mind and body separate or mind and body the same. Um, second, we are going to fast forward almost 2,000 years, going to about 1600s in the Enlightenment. Descartes is the next big name, um, and he is the first to kind of add a form of science into this idea of trying to figure out the soul. He does this um, it, through uh, in the 1600s very sneakily by body snatching um, and cutting open corpses, even though he was not supposed to be doing this. Um, but he did this by uh, looking at animals, looking at bodies, and um, kind of recognizing and finding what we now think of like brain fluid, right? Um, we're recognizing a, a very natural part of our brains they keep that does have a lot to do with our processing. But he saw that and his first thought was, I know what that is. That's animal spirits floating around on there that's giving us all this information, obviously. Clearly, it's not what it was. Um, but he found also found neuron tubes and believed that the, this was coursing spirits of animals and ancestors through us. None of that's what it is. But he was still the first to find this idea and recognizing that we have fluids, we have these neurons, we have all these parts um, of like the, the brain and the processing. Um, and he connected those even if he connected them incorrectly. 
afterwards, a little bit more modern thinkers. Um, we have Bacon as well as Locke. Um, these Francis Bacon and John Locke, um, more Enlightenment thinkers, they are a little bit more belief uh, of kind of this like monism and the belief in modern day experimentation um, and that we kind of go through things by experience, right? We go through something and then we learn in some way or the other. Um, so Bacon is the, the starts this idea off, but doesn't really truly uh, finish it. Locke is on that often gives credit for it with this idea of a tabula rusa, um, is that the mind is a blank slate. We are born totally empty. And then over the course of our lives and our experience, things get written on that blank slate, right? That would be our mind. That would be our bodies. That would be like soul of psychology, right? We start blank, completely blank. And then over the course of our lives, um, we are able to develop and understand those things. But um, what they're really trying to get at, what these earliest thinkers are trying to get at is this question of why are we the way we are? Why do good people do good things? Why do evil people do evil things? Were they born that way? Um, or are they many of the believed that, yes, they were always going to be that way? Um, the, Descartes would have said that, like, you, you have these animal spirits in your brain coursing through you, and they're telling you to do this, that, or the other. Whereas Locke would have said, you were born neither good nor evil, but you are made good or evil. Right? And neither of them are entirely correct. There's like a little bit of, of, of both. Um, but this is a debate that we continue to rage and we, or continues to rage on no matter what. And there really isn't a right answer. This, however, I will say is kind of the core of everything that we're going to do this year. Okay, So I want you to really think about this question. If you see this before class, think about it because we're going to talk about it in class. If you've seen it after class, then you've already had a chance to talk about it a little bit. So um, thinking about this idea, how are if people are born good or evil? Or are they made good or evil? How do we, how does, how do we go about doing that? How can we possibly answer that? Um, and especially if psychology, as we said, is a science, how are we possibly going to do that? And how you would do that, um, one of many different things, and we'll get into all of this as we go on, um, is trying to do that with science, but we can't really do that. But the best way that they've found uh, to be able to do this are um, these, this understanding of to get down to nature and nurture is you'd have to have people that have identical something we're trying to control variables. And so you would say, well, we'll control and understand we'll, we'll take twins or triplets even and look at them and say, well, their nature should be the same, right? They've got the same genes. Maybe if they have different experiences, maybe if they were raised in different households, then we could figure out what makes them that way. Um, this documentary is incredible. I can't tell you what it's on. I watched it last summer. Um, it's either, I want to say it's on Hulu. Um, it may be on Netflix. So really, really good. It's about three um, identical triplets who were separated at birth, raised in different homes as a part of this big study that only later came out that they were a part of a study and they found each other. Awesome story. Really, really interesting. Um, but this is how psychology would answer this. I'm not going to, we're not going to go in, in depth into this yet. This is just, again, big ideas and this idea that nature versus nurture um, is a huge part of psychological thought and the early parts of psychological thought. They're trying to figure out why people are the way they are. Are they good? Are they bad? Why are they that way? Um, and there's so many things that go into this, right? It's not just, um, right, you're, you're born a certain way. We're all kind of born with an innate set of characteristics and genes and then nurture also comes in to some extent a little bit both but it's a big spectrum and there are people that say it's entirely one there are psychologists that believe that's entirely the other right there we are all kind of like on this spectrum somewhere or the other um somewhere up and down the this like range of beliefs on um, nature versus nurture debate um and that's kind of one of the big questions i want you to work on throughout the year is trying to understand are people the way they are because of nature, nurture, um, or it's going to be a little bit of both, but like which one is going to be more potent? Okay, be thinking about that. We're going to talk about that all year. Okay, so as I said, in talking about that, um, there's this big debate between nature and nurture, um, and then the different approaches to psychology, which is what we're going to talk about next, um, all range across this line, right? So those that say it's nature, right? That nature and our genes, our genetic code is what that's going to make us the way we are. It'd be a more biological approach, be believing that our genes are going to make a difference. Um, those that are going to be more nurture based are going to look at things um, like our behavior and the way that we were treated as children. Um, so these are all things we're going to go over eventually, but just know that there is this debate, uh, nature versus nurture and psychology is at the core of that etymology of the soul of understanding why people are the way they are. 
that was the historical. Let's talk about the early perspectives of psychology. I'm going to dump a lot of names on you here. Um, that these are things that like at most make up like 2% of the psych test. You will probably see one or two of these names on the psych test for sure. So you got to know them, be ready for them, but you're not going to have to know like a ton of details about them. So I'm going to give you the big ideas. It's going to save you a lot of time. So you don't have to read 30 textbook pages. Um, it goes in depth on these slides. Let's go through this quickly. Okay. So the OGs of psychology, right? Because we don't think of Socrates and Aristotle as a, as, as true psychologists. They were philosophers. These people, um, these were the actual first psychologist. So um, this is, so reminder, psychology, big idea. It's a science. And the guy that really sets that off is this dude here. His name is Wilhelm Wundt. Um, good German name. Looks like William Wundt. It's Wilhelm Wundt. And in Leipzig, Germany, he starts the first psychology lab um, where at his university, he is doing actual studies. He is doing research. Search, right it's 1890s so they don't have any intense things studying the brain yet um it's you know 130 years ago but um he was the first people playing first person actually doing tests actually trying to figure out um and with data with research actually trying to determine why people are the way they are and actually recognizing things for instance um the difference between our like um our processing speeds right he literally was like doing tests to figure out how fast he could recognize things um, and so what you need to know with him is this, right, is that it is the birth of modern psychology. If nothing else, that's what you got to know from Wundt. OK, he was trying to figure out these things like he called them the atoms of the mind. But that's just another word for it. he was trying to figure out how we processed and thought of things. Um, so he is the father of modern psychology. That's the thing you got to know for him. Very first um, psych researcher. Okay, He's the one that, uh, that gets credit with it, making it a science. So Wundt, big name. Rest of these all kind of branch off from him. Still important, but Wundt's the big you got to know. So a big part of Wundt is that what he really does is that those that are under him shoot out and make all of the, the next forms of psychology. So Edward Titchener and G. Stanley Hall, two other names you should know. These are also vocab terms you're going to have to fill out a card for. Um, Titchener, one of his students, goes back to Cornell in the U.S. and introduces what he calls and founds this new form of psychology. He takes what he learned from Wundt and kind of turns it into a new form of psychology he calls structuralism. Um, we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, G. Stanley Hall, another student of Wundt's, creates the first psychology lab in the United States. So Titchener associated him with structuralism. G. Stanley Hall, Hall is often seems like a like a um, like a lecture hall. He's the first one to create a lab in the United States. Okay, so that's what you have to know for both of those two. Both former students of what um other people we need to know william james right around this time um is also in the u.s starting to kind of study psychology and look into it he is, doesn't quite get the credit that Bunt does but he is the first to write a textbook william james textbook that's the name that you should, that's how you should associate those um he's also the first to first teacher in the united states um to teach psychology and he is the founder, kind of as the opponent of um, structuralism, G. Stanley Hall structuralism. William James founds this idea of functionalism. Okay, so I'll go over and get those in a minute. Just one second. So um, if you hadn't guessed this yet, it was the late 1800s, you had American history one or two. But I love this in the textbook, and you're going to miss it um, that they they used this lingo. But in the textbook, I screenshot this out of it because it cracked me up so much. They referred to the early days of psychology as formerly male and pale. Um, uh, otherwise saying that it was a white guy dominated field. All of these, uh, any of the former, the like early famous psychologists are all men. And that's not just the late 1800s. That goes for like the first hundred years of psychology, um, really like, until the 60s and 70s. Very, very male dominated field. Um, a couple big names like Kenneth and Mamie Clark. Uh, Kenneth is the first African-American to run the, um, the American, American Society of American Psychological Association, APA, um, runs the first after the uh, APA. Yeah, I think it's the APA. Um, first run. I don't need to know. Yeah, the APA, um, American Psychological Association. So Kenneth Clark, first African American to do that. Kenneth Clark, pretty well known if you've done that. Um, he was, um, his studies on race were huge in the Brown versus Board decision. Um, he is well known. He worked for several different um, presidential campaigns, like a, a pretty big name psychologist uh, that really brought a lot more fame to the field. Um, but in these early days, very, 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 very white 
and guys. Um, there are a couple women that break into the field. You've got Washburn and Calkins. You should know both of these. Um, but they, like any women in the 1890s, early 1900s, faced a lot of pushback. Um, uh, Mary Calkins was the student of William James. Um, she worked under him, and she would eventually become the first president of the APA in 1918. Um, and under James, she did all of the work necessary to earn a Harvard PhD, um, and they refused to give it to her because at the time, they were only serving their PhDs to men. They were like, yes, you've done it all. We'll let you have our sister school's PhD. She's like, no, I, I earned a PhD from Harvard. I'm going to get it from Harvard or not at all. And they said, okay, no. And she never got a PhD like a boss. Um, just refused it, and they still let her become um, the first female president in 1918. So Calkins, um, a big deal. Margaret Washburn is another one, the first awarded PhD, so officially the first PhD uh, woman in psychology in 1894. And then she was president after Mary Calkins um, about a decade later. So uh, big ideas of structuralism versus functionalism as we are wrapping this up. Um, remember James and Titchener are your two structural uh, – James is your functionalist. Titchener is your structuralist. Big idea differences between these structuralism and Titchener. Uh, their ultimate goal is to classify and categorize elements of the human mind. So basically they thought we could figure out like when you see an animal, there's a piece of your brain and we want to figure out what part of the brain is actually processing that as an animal, right? Like that's not something you can do in 1890. And the way they did that was asking people, right? They say, tell me what you think about this flower and hold up a rose. And you'd be like, it smells good. It's red. It makes me feel happy. And you'd like write all this down and be like, oh, of course. All right, I'm learning things. You're not really learning things. Introspections, bluesy people aren't great at actually describing what they're thinking or feeling, um, as Freud would eventually go into and try to talk about. But introspection is recognized as kind of problematic. And so because of that, structuralism fades. You would need to know structuralism. They used introspection or talking about what you're feeling and experiencing. Um, and then how, as that fades, so does structuralism. Functionalism on the other side um, is done by William James, and their goal is to understand and explain human thoughts and experiences, emotions, why we do things. Um, and it was very based in evolution, very based in Darwinism. And these are things that are a lot more um, objective, right? You can make a lot, a lot stronger claims in thinking, why do humans eat? Why do humans, why are humans aggressive? Um, why, um, Right? Why do humans have all of these certain desires? And if in the understood and the evolutionary perspective, you can make a lot of, of really clear claims driven by actual observations. You can't really do that in structuralism. So structuralism falls apart as a science, but functionalism um, kind of evolves and turns into an evolutionary perspective more so. So associate the names functionalism and structuralism with Titchener, structuralism, James, functionalism, and then know the big ideas of what they are. Okay. So um, this is something we'll also like over in class. Um, other early perspectives you should know are psychoanalysis, behaviorism, and gestalt psychology. Um, these we will go over in my next screencast, 1.1b. So be ready for that. Um, and yeah, good stuff. If you got any questions, write them in the box. Other than that, I will bid you adieu.